I left Durango the same way I had arrived. I had originally intended to just start heading west from there, but after a few thousand miles I decided I'd had it with my helmet. It was a great helmet for the money, but it was just too heavy. It had started bothering me probably after about the fourth or fifth day of the trip. I ordered a replacement and I was having it shipped to a store in Ogden, Utah, so I rode back to stay with my friends in Salt Lake so I could just pick it up there. I went with an Arai XD4. I had been trying to find Climb's carbon fiber helmet because it was so light, but I was having no luck finding it in stock anywhere in the size I needed, so I just went with a tried and true brand. This choice of route, of course, was a blessing and a curse. The great part was I was riding those windy Colorado roads without having to worry about getting ahead of Maya. This meant I could push the bike harder and get around slow drivers without worrying if there was enough room for someone following me to get by as well. The downside was that all too soon I was back on those flat midwest highways. I could have picked some curvy mountain forest roads to break things up, but I really wasn't feeling super confident on the bike still, especially with it loaded as heavy as it was.
My plan from Salt Lake was to head west to see another friend of mine that lived outside San Francisco. We had worked together for a few years, sometime in the mid-late 2000s, and had kept in touch since. I also started looking at adventure rider forums online and getting ideas of where to ride, which was something I should have been doing from the start. The first suggestion I saw was a route called Nebo Loop, a 45 mile road that passes Mount Nebo between the towns of Payson and Nephi in Utah. It turned out to be a great two lane asphalt route with a decent rise in elevation. I, I liked elevation because it meant temperatures were cooler. Near the top, I came across a car that had recently spun out of control. It looked like he'd bend it in the side of the hill twice and peeled the rubber off his left front tire. I considered stopping for a moment, but I wasn't really sure what I could do without room for a passenger, and someone was already stopped and helping them. From Nephi, I made my way to Delta, Utah, and while there, decided to check out the Japanese internment camp located just outside of town. In February 1942, President Franklin Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066 that required people of Japanese ancestry to be moved into what were then called relocation centers during World War II. Topaz Relocation Center was opened that September and would remain open for three years, finally closing in October of 1945. Originally the camp was almost 20,000 acres in size. The bulk of the area was used for farming, so the camp would be largely self-sustaining. 640 acres were set aside for the main living area. There were approximately 9,000 internees and staff, which at the time made it the fifth largest city in Utah. There were no structures remaining when I visited. The only evidence any of this even happened at the site were just two large marble plaques and the flag. It was after this visit I decided to try a feature my Garmin GPS had, which was called Adventurous Routing. It chooses routes that prefer curvy roads, hills, and fewer highways. In my case, it immediately put me on a sandy single track back towards Highway 6. It was the first time I rode the loaded bike in sand, and after a few minutes I was feeling pretty confident. Confident enough that I was in third gear when I hit a soft patch and was almost sent flying when the bike started bucking from side to side. I left it in second gear after that. The sand track eventually led to a packed gravel road, but was almost immediately blocked by a barbed wire fence. After riding back around the area looking for another way out, it finally dawned on me that maybe the fence was just for cattle and therefore movable. Sure enough, it was just held up by a couple small loops of barbed wire. I moved it out of the way, rode through, and closed it before continuing the last half mile or so to Highway 50. My next destination was the Great Basin National Park. I lost the video for this part of the trip, and I'm still not sure how, but I at least saved a few photos. I had the idea that I'd ride up as far as I could and then find a camping spot. What I forgot is that I hadn't planned any of this trip, so I hadn't made reservations at any campsite. 
it was a lesson I wouldn't learn the entire trip and would pay for again and again. The ride up, however, was great. It was a gently curving road up to Wheeler Peak Trailhead, which the bike GPS showed at 9,600 feet above sea level. I stretched my legs and walked down the trails to a viewing area. I, I could definitely feel the altitude, so I didn't push myself very much. I rode back down the mountain, and after finding all the camping spots full, resigned myself to finding a place to sleep in Eli, Nevada. The following day, I would continue my trip west down Highway 50, dubbed the loneliest highway in America by Life Magazine in July of 1986.